Good afternoon and welcome or welcome back to the auditorium for our second uh, panel here today. My name is uh, Daphne Dragona and I'm one of the curators of Transmedia Festival. So within the scope of this year's edition, as you probably have already heard, we explore how the notions of affect, care and empathy are challenged through contemporary technologies today and we discuss their promises and limitations starting from Raymond Williams' Structures of Feeling and his emphasis on uh, lived experience and affective consciousness, we want to explore how these notions connect to today's technologies of feeling. Can, for instance, contemporary systems and infrastructures allow their users to become more aware, to feel more, or to relate differently to each other? This afternoon, um, we will be discussing if and how our capacity to affect and be affected changes within today's sensory environments. The panel is organized in collaboration with the Winchester School of Arts and will be moderated by Ryan Bishop. Ryan is a professor for, of global art and politics at the Winchester School of Art, University of Southampton, and is a director of the Archaeologists of Media and Technology Research Group at the Winchester School of Arts. His research areas include critical theory, visual culture, urbanism, aesthetics, critical military studies, architecture, sensory perception, and knowledge formation. Ryan has two forthcoming books entitled Avant-Garde Art and Tech Labs and Zero Degree Scene. Please welcome Ryan and then our speakers. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. On behalf of uh, Winchester School of Art, University of Southampton, my many colleagues there, we want to thank Transmedia Ali again for um, allowing us to collaborate in such a productive and fecund manner. Um, I would also like to take just a minute because um, Daphne and uh, Christopher Gansing work incredibly hard year round and they often don't get a chance for us to provide a proper sense of appreciation and I'd like to do that now. Okay, I'm going to just say a few words, then I'm going to introduce the panelists, and they will come up um, without me appearing in between, and then there'll be Q&A at the end, and you'll have to put up with my appearance there. Um, amongst other phenomena, Raymond Williams' Structures of Feeling refers to that which is emergent, inchoate, and not yet ready to be articulated fully in rational form. Williams was roundly castigated for the terms bagginess and lack of rigor, but the looseness of the concept and its performance proves useful as a supplement or a precursor to or swerve around current affect theory, a way to render more complex, nuanced, and determined by macro forces the emotive world we occupy and that occupies us. More feeling than thought, Williams wrote, they were nonetheless structures operational in the world that provided quote, patterns of impulses, restraints, and tones. It's hard to imagine a world in which restraints operate. Constraints, most certainly, but restraints, how beautifully nostalgic that is. People acting with and from restraint. It's, 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 it's really extraordinary. Reworking our brain to attune it to patterns of impulses, restraints, and tones also means reworking our brain to differing rhythms and temporalities. Speculative design is one way of doing this, of envisioning potential futures that can help us align various trajectories and organize them differently. As George Carlin once said, electricity is just organized lightning. Structures of feeling are means of getting at the complex presence of the present and our tainted or inflected understanding of it. A philosopher who had long connections with Berlin in a period not unlike our own in specific ways wrote about the synchronicity of temporalities and the power of the non-synchronous and did so in ways that anticipate Williams's formulations. According to Ernst Bloch in his 1930s work, Heritage of Our Times, capitalist modernity as it ensnared Europe at that moment in the 1930s might define that present as the most advanced economy, but it did not account for the entirety of contemporary experience. Any present for Bloch 
still contains modes of life that belong to earlier times, as well as visualizations and formulations of times to come, both of which lead various groups in non-synchronous relations to the present. There is danger in this, for he claims repressive regimes are able to draw upon cultural resources that should rightfully belong to the left. And there is potential in this condition. The task, writes Bloch, is to release those elements, even of the non-contemporaneous contradiction, which are capable of aversion and transformation, namely those hostile to capitalism, homeless in it, and to remount them for functioning in a different connection. The power of the non-synchronous resources of the past lies in the fact that they remain incomplete, unresolved, and hence lastingly, oops, and hence lastingly subversive and utopian. They are the gold-bearing rubble of a prevented future, all of which for us in the present is not to suggest that phenomena are reducible to an economic or even technological determinism, but merely to acknowledge the means by which macro forces work at the granular level of quotidian experience or structures of feeling and what we might do in the face of it. To grab this gold-bearing rubble is to be critical with the etymology of this term, as the term crisis as well, comes from the Indo-European root cry which refers to sifting, to winnowing, to having the, the capacity to separate the chaff from the grain, to discard that which does not nourish and hold on to that which does. This is also the project of reworking the brain as addressed by the participants on this panel. Those participants, as you know, are Hyphen Lab and Tony Sampson. Hyphen Labs, who ran a workshop on Wednesday entitled Mind Maps, and who have an interview in the most recent edition of Alessandro Ludovico's magazine, Neural, is a speculative design studio and think tank founded in 2014 by Carmen Aguiar and Eche Tanko and joined by Ashley Bacchus in 2016. Combining interests and backgrounds in architecture, neuroscience, design, and creative writing, the studio has been collaborating on the continuing project Neurospeculative Afrofuturism, which they'll speak to today. This is a platform for open-ended narrative and VR exploration. Hyphen Labs works at the intersection of art, technology, science, and the future. Tony Sampson is a critical theorist with an interest in philosophies of media, technology, and neural cultures. His publications include The Spam Book, co-edited with UC Parika, my colleague and good friend at Winchester School of Art. Virality, Contagion Theory in the Age of Networks, The Assemblage Brain, Sense, making in neuroculture, and I, I know that uh, Hyphen Labs has been carrying around a marked up copy of this, so expect some questions, Tony. <laughs> and uh, Affect and Social Media, Emotion, Mediation, Anxiety, and Contagion. His next book is called A Sleepwalker's Guide to Social Media, which will be published by Polity Press in 2020. Um, in addition to his published work, Tony is the host and organizer of the Affect and Social Media International Conferences in East London and co-founder of the Public Engagement Initiative, the Cultural Engine Research Group. He currently works as a reader in digital me media cultures and communication at the University of East London in the UK. So now I'd like to welcome Hyphen Labs to the stand. Hello, everyone. Thank Hello. you so much for having us. Um, since this is our biggest audience, we're obliged to take a selfie with you guys. We'll see, we'll see if we can so, make it work. <laughs> if you all want to say hello. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Great way to start things out. <laughs> so, um, I'm Carmen. And I'm Ash. And um, we wanted to introduce you guys to some of our work, as well as talk to you about how we're very inspired by artists and designers who take an interdisciplinary approach and develop their own design language, which is why we are paying homage to Virgil Abloh in our ever-evolving, um, our own practice in our own studio. 
We're also interested in the way that he is unafraid to look across disciplines and to really orient himself within different um, artistic practices, design practices, theories in order to manifest his work. So we try to do the same thing in how we approach the projects that we take on. So just to give you a little introduction of who we are, we are four core members right now collaborating with more than 20 other individuals. I'm Carmen, I'm from San Francisco and Cozumel, Mexico. Ejia Tankal is from Turkey and she's an architect. Oh yeah, I was an engineer in my previous life. I'm Ash Bacchus clark um, In a previous life, I was a molecular biologist studying stem cell research for a really long time. And now I've made the transition into writing and thinking critically about neuroscience, um, virtual reality, systems of belief, and speculation on our future. And we've recently started working with Romy, who's um, coming from a background in psychology. And she's from Egypt and from the UK. So as we are trying to develop a design language, we're, looking, we're trying to look at threads that go through all of our projects. And we'll give you guys a bit of context around the work that we do, talking about um, our project Neurospeculative Afrofeminism, um, as well as some of the other things that we're working on. Um, but we like to think about how to translate between realities. Um, whether that's a virtual reality or our physical reality, whether it's my reality in um, you know, the United Kingdom, uh, which is where our studio is based now, or w if we're trying to communicate and translate through um, realities that exist all over the world. And that allows us to collaborate between different disciplines. We get to experiment between mediums. Um, with backgrounds in architecture and design, we like to be physical, but we also have a familiarity with uh, the digital. And this also allows us to develop our own aesthetic. Um, by, and by doing this, we find that it's quite empowering, and we hope that our example can then empower others, incorporating a radical, critical, and plural design approach looking at the speculative and creating alternative visions while also having a lot of fun. I'm gonna talk about a project um, that we made called Neurospeculative Afrofeminism. Um, we debuted in 2016 at the Sundance Film Festival at New Frontier. And it's a project that looks across four different disciplines. So virtual reality, neuroscience, um, speculative object design, and installation. And we wanted to look at what a world would look like if black women were um, purveyors of culture through neuroscience. So we created this fantastical world where we reimagined a hair salon as a brain salon. So you go into our VR experience and you think you're going to get your hair done, but you're actually going to get your brain optimized. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different parts of the project. Uh, it started with the objects. So Carmen and I were living together in New York at this time and it was a really hot summer. It was also the summer of 2016 when all that was coming across our media feed lines, everything that was on the news, on our Twitter uh, headlines were talking about the extrajudicial killing of black men at the hands of the police. And so this was our lived reality and we were both doing something very different at the time but we felt like we had something to say about it, me as you know, being someone who lives in a black body every day and Carmen being one of my oldest friends. Um, we've known each other for 14 years. So being in New York, being in the tech scene, we found that we wanted to talk about it. And um, so we started ideating this project and then we called EJ and we're like, hey, we wanna do this thing, let's make it, let's do it. So it started with these objects, um, and they're all around themes of security, protection, visibility, um, and, and recontextualizing. So um, as you can see here, this is a render of some of the objects that we made and that we have on display when we uh, show this piece in, inside of our physical installation. So it started with a transparent sunscreen. Um, and why we made a transparent sunscreen is, I don't know uh, if any of you have had this experience before, but if you put a sunscreen on and you don't rub it in properly and it discolors your skin, 
well, for people that have darker skin, it's really hard to, you know, use this product that is meant to protect you and also be able to step outside with, you know, normal looking skin because now you have like white residue all over your face. So it started there of thinking about design solutions and interventions and thinking about things that should um, be considered but usually aren't in the design process. And, and within then, industry. And within dis in industry. Um, and then from there, it went on to us thinking more broadly about everyday objects and how we can embed those objects with uh, technological t capabilities to protect and augment ourselves. So we created an earring in collaboration with one of our good friends and an artist, uh, Michelle Cortez, and they're called the RubyCam earrings. So they're video and audio enabled. Um, they're modeled after the door knocker earring that's pervasive in hip hop culture. So you put these earrings on, you can start recording with a touch of a button. Um, and any type of police any brutality. Type of, or just any or sort of altercation where there are unknown variables. Because we see when we take out mm -hmm. our phone, it has become a weapon. Um, people know that you're recording. And in situations where there is a, a misbalance of power. Having your phone out and recording the situation can put you and everyone else around you in danger. So we wanted to embed these cap capabilities into an everyday object where you could capture footage and then upload it to a cloud and you know, hopefully sometime in the future be able to have a database, a searchable database of repeat offenders. Um, and then we created a visor that um, the material is like a mirror. So you put it on and it's, it's made out of dichroic. Um, and it's a microaggression deflecting visor, and we collaborated with um, AB Screenware. Mm -hmm. And something that's interesting about the visor was we, this was the first moment when we started bringing the physical objects into the digital world, um, giving all of our avatars visors um, so that we could, <laughs> so that we, we could, one, not animate their faces, um, but that too we could have a larger discussion around our own privacy and creating digit, um, safe spaces within these virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. Another uh, piece that we collaborated with Adam Harvey is called Hyperface, and this is a low-tech low counter-surveillance textile, um, and it is meant to obfuscate the face by giving a lower confidence score to your face than the faces on the textile that will be um, viewed by a computer vision algorithm. And then the most speculative object that we designed are the Octavia electrodes. And this is where we started incorporating the neuro speculative uh, yeah. angle. So Octavia electrodes were named after Octavia Butler. You know, we were reading a lot of Octavia Butler during this time and thinking about some of her theories and how they are embedded into the current culture that we live in. And so we reimagined a technology that exists in neuroscience called transcranial stimulation. Um, and without an interest in actually wanting to recreate this technology, as so many people in these biohacking movements or quantified self movements are using consumer grade devices in order to you know, give a low level stimulation to their brain and either get into flow states more readily or thinking that that is somehow optimizing them. We wanted to be in conversation with people that were doing that and see if we could simulate something to that effect in virtual reality. And so this is where we created our neurocosmetology lab. So, in it, um, we reimagined these electrodes as a device that comes down when you sit in the chair, and and it can be they also your brain. be incorporated into hair, braiding hair extensions yeah. so that you could access it with hair braiding techniques. Because the the way that it exists now can be limited to um, anybody who has maybe bigger hair. Um, we see it similarly with the Oculus Visor, where somebody who were, people who designed the device probably didn't have much hair and had really great vision. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so we're trying to remix some of these uh, existing technologies. Yeah, we've lost several headsets to that, getting caught around people's curls. Um, and so it, aside from that, our work is about design provocations, right? We want people to think about how you're designing something and who you're designing it for. 
And so in, in the piece, we drop you into this speculative world and you're embodied in the body of a young black woman and you go through this experience where you meet our main character, her name is Brooke. She's a world-renowned neuroscientist who had to go into exile because of some of the technologies that she created. Um, and this woman here, is, her name is Naima. She's the venture capitalist who's funded Brooks's enterprises. And so it's this whole story that we imagine. It's world building. And beyond anything else, we're trying to show empowering images of black women in VR as it's evolving, as it's becoming um, more ingrained in popular culture and, and mainstream media. Because we don't want it to be like film where stories that are more um, representative of, of a wider demographic are left to the margins and, and we're left striving, trying to find a place in it. And we would had the experience that we were ready to build this game and we started looking on Turbo Squid and like three, 3D libraries and we couldn't find any beautiful representations of black and brown women that we thought could exist in our game. Um, so we decided to make our own. And so in this experience, you in, in the physical installation, we invite you into a hair salon. And then you sit down in, um, in the space, and we give you the Oculus or the VR headset, and you go into this digital hair salon. You meet these um, researchers, and you have a simulation of a optimization session. And in this optimization session, you go through a new architecture, a new world that isn't defined by the physics of our reality. And you go through the mirror and you lose your body. So mm. we wanted to play with embodiment and disembodiment. Um, and so when you fly through this new vision sequence where you, the physics of the world isn't adherent to the physics of reality, um, you have a sense that you're looking at an old world falling into the ether. Um, so old media representations of, of that have been shown about black women and black women's bodies are falling into the lava. And then you get down to a pantheon and you see a pantheon of new representations of black women. And then you come back out of it and you're back into the lab and you've been changed in some sort of way. You know, your hair is different when you look in the mirror. Um, and they give you a message. They have a message for you. So, and this is also available. We wanted to make this accessible. You know, we want n creators to be making VR and to see themselves in virtual reality. And we were also using this virtual reality as a um, test to see if we could reduce prejudice and bias, or if we could inspire young young people and young creatives to see if they had agency in the space. And to have. Uh, cross-cultural conversations about um, anti-blackness because anti-blackness really is transnational and um, you know if we can create a safe space in order to talk about these things and to bring to light the things that are not only going on in the US but are also you know sort of happening abroad as well then you know we want to create a place where people can talk and learn and have conversations around these things and historically that's been a hair salon uh, it's been a place for political and social activation. So we wanted to create that space in the, in the very delicate fabric that we're living in now. Um, so here you can see uh, one of the installations that we had at, at Tribeca. We also want to show you um, the team that we worked with. We came from all over. We have many different backgrounds, um, but we all had a real passion for this story and for creating something, something different. Um, and so we'll show you a little teaser of the, the piece.
not quite sure how much time we have, but we'll try to rush through the, the rest of it so we can get to the next speaker. But we also wanted to show you guys a little bit of some other work that we're doing, because we're talking about cre being designers that can help change minds. Um, the, we collaborated with the National Safety Commission and Missing Pieces on a national campaign that was out about the opioid epidemic. And this project was at a very different scale. Rather than me trying to reach hundreds and thousands of people, this project ended up reaching millions of people. So in this, we'll show you a quick video. <laughs> Project we collaborated. His fall was pretty bad. I've had four knee surgeries. I fell off the scaffold and injured my back. First thing was a medication plan for pain. It was just like, write the script, put the Band-Aid on it. I have friends. I actually gave away my last medication. We just kind of swap, or if one doctor denies you, you go to a different doctor. I went to my grandmother's house, right. I was taking her pills. It was good when I was taking it. It's just mentally and physically exhausting trying to pretend that Something is not wrong when there is. Okay, so there's something that I would like to show you. Every one of those little pills represent a person that we lost. Okay, so this was a, a quite a different project for us. It was um, proposed by, or brought to us by Missing Pieces, and we collaborated with Tucker Walsh to do the film direction, but we designed the space. Um, the main goal was have it uh, be a modular installation that could represent 22,000 individuals and we, um, that die each year from opioid-related deaths, um, specifically prescription um, pills. And how we augmented this was by creating an infinity effect and um, talking about how this, this problem and this stigma is much larger than just prescriptions um, and that it reaches not just in people in the United States but really across the world. So we wanted to divide the space into um, three parts. One where we could do a data visualization where we could have a live running CNC machine that um, every 22 minutes was carving a face, um, which is the rate at which someone dies from an opioid related death. We also wanted to create um, rooms for um, kind of memory rooms. There were three individuals whose stories were being highlighted um, we wanted to incorporate the familiarity of medicine cabinets and what the and the severity of what's inside of them, um, and then we had the the large wall. And in our our most recent project we're working on is called the Anxious Ocean and the Moon Bathers, and this is a new commission that um, we worked on as a graphic piece where we are spec, you know, thinking about and talking about the post-anthropocene or the post-human uh, world. So our story to start this experience is over a short period of time, the oceans have been saturated with the human leftovers and their genetic footprints. These DNA-carrying plastics permeated into the microorganisms, transferring their human-like traits into the aquatic residents. The marine life is now in an anxious ocean infused with human consciousness. The anxious ocean and the moon bathers depicts a day in this post-human world. So in this, we're hoping to incorporate the anxieties that we have and potentially see if we can, again, use VR in order to change people's behaviors, to change their minds by telling an eco-womanish uh, story about the post-human world. So that's it. Thank you so much for having us.
Uh, crikey, it's a big crowd. I, I can't do a selfie because I don't have a mobile phone to do it on, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just imagine it. Okay, I'd like to begin by saying thank you to Ryan and Yussi from Winchester for uh, helping organise this with uh, the festival organisers. It's been an amazing conference. I, I get emails from people uh, reminding me to check in at the airport and that kind of detail. It's amazing stuff. So thank you very much for that. So what I thought I'd do here is uh, try to broadly uh, address some of the themes of the conference itself and uh, this particular session. So in light of the conference theme on emotion, feeling and affect, and then the idea of reworking, or what I'll probably just talk about is working the brain, I wanted to uh, have a, a kind of broad approach to how uh, we've conceived of the brain or how the brain image has been conceived of in recent years. And there's been some interesting sort of twists, turns, and paradigm shifts uh, involved here. So you know, I'm going to kind of broadly kind of approach this uh, in this talk. Not a good start. Okay, so look, you know, before the 1990s, I'm not going to go back too far. We haven't got time to do that. So before the 1990s, we would talk roughly uh, of being in what we might describe as the classic uh, cognitive theoretical frame of the brain. So you, know, you might be familiar with some of these diagrams. Uh, in short, it's a kind of metaphor for the brain as computer or the computer brain, if you like. Uh, it's specifically about a brain which is an information processor uh, it has a number of uh, uh, characteristics to it. You know, it's information in, information out. The processor in the middle works on uh, representations. There's some kind of like, storage, memory storage. So you can see the kind of analogy between the computer and the brain. So, you know, you might ask, well, if that's the model in the 1990s, you know, how do we address the kind of themes of this conference? Um, Really, that model uh, was uh, bereft of any kind of mention of emotion. And when emotions were uh, included, uh, things like feelings, affect emotions, were kind of described as marginal, uh, noisy, messy, and even kind of irrational. So we know that things have changed greatly. And that's an image I show to my students to kind of give them some sense of how, you know, having no emotions makes you more rational and how Spock, the character, kind of fights off the irrational emotion. Right, so, you know, things begin to change, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm keeping this quite broad. Uh, I'm going to draw on two uh, neuroscientists, popular neuroscientists, to kind of make this point. There's obviously a lot of work behind this. But uh, we can characterise this kind of shift from the cognitive frame into a new paradigm, right? We can call this the emotional turn by looking at the work of one, on the one hand, of uh, Joe Lado. Uh, Joe Lado is a guy who kind of made his name scaring the hell out of rats, by all, all uh, accounts. So by, by scaring them, he, he, he made this kind of correlation between a part of the brain called the amygdala, amygdala and uh, the processing of fear, and then traces that kind of upstream to more refined thinking, uh, such things as rats making choices and decisions. Yeah? So similarly, uh, uh, Antonio Damasio, who's probably the more popular and well-known uh, person out of this too, uh, came up with a somatic marker thesis, which I'm sure, again, a lot of you are familiar with. But that's the idea that in some way, you know, affect uh, is kind of registered in the body and, again, is involved in this upstream-downstream movement from kind of, you know, bodily, uh, 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 emotional, affective, feely relationships that directly link to decisions and choices, cognition. So, uh, you know, you can see here the quote at the bottom how Damasio starts distancing himself and this work from the old cognitive paradigm. Uh, emotions and feelings may not be the intruders in the bastion of reason at all, they may be enmeshed in its very networks. And that's kind of like, you know, the, the, the shape of that new paradigm. So from my perspective, it's been really interesting in a way that uh, this work has influenced what I kind of see myself as, which is broadly uh, uh, a kind of new, new materialist, affect theorist. And, you know, Damasio, particularly not just his contra-Cartesian uh, approach, but his kind of alliances with Spinoza, have obviously, you know, had a, a big impact and, and validated in some respect some of the ideas from the theorists in affect theory. So, you know, just looking at the first uh, two books along from uh, uh, the Spinoza book, you know, Patricia Clough's uh, uh, Affective Turn, there's direct references to Mas Damasio there. Similarly, you know, uh, Greg and, and Seaworth's uh, Affect Reader, big books in this kind of area, there are direct references in there to Damasio and, and of course, others. Um, I, I put uh, Kate Howe's new book on there because that is similarly, you know, 
based on a, a kind of theory of the non-conscious um, as established around Damasio. But there, there's a definite uh, difference between that book and the other two, but I'll get on to talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so what, what, what we have really here is this kind of, uh, these ideas from brain science have, have given some sort of, uh, you know, validation to an idea that the affect exists in some kind of non-conscious way. So not unconscious, but non-conscious. Um, you know, I'm particularly interested in the way that these theories not have an influence, but the way they, they relate to proto-affect uh, theories. You know, if we look again through to uh, Bergson, you know, Bergson was really interested in the kind of uh, the impulsive decision acts, right? Acts that are kind of, you know, impulsive rather than being thought. In fact, if you read some of Bergson, you know, he, he almost treats cognition as kind of a hesitation that comes at some point after those impulses have kicked in. You know, Whitehead similarly uh, looks at a, an aesthetic ontology. Uh, I love uh, Isabel Stenger's kind of, uh, uh, you know, take on, um, on, on Whitehead, which is, you know, we think that that cognition is like a command post, but actually it's just a mere foothold in the reality, you know, the process and reality. And uh, another great uh, uh, book, of course, is Neo-Finalism, Roman Royer, um, who sees perpetual, uh, per sorry, perceptual reality, the kind of cognis cognitive part, as secondary to a primacy of absolute survey or absolute sensation. So you can see how these kind of old workings of the non-conscious start to correlate with the stuff that Damasio does and then feeds into uh, affect theory. Okay, just to, uh, uh, just to you know, draw, uh, uh, make a little bit of a fuss about this. There's um, a, 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 you know, a, 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 a not a straightforward idea of what the non-conscious is. I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with Kate Howe's uh, latest book. There's a, a rather kind of um, lively uh, take on, on new materialism and some criticism of new materialism. So I think you can probably draw a line between these two books in their approach to the non-conscious. One, uh, Kate Howe's one, would be still, I think, working within that cognitive theoretical frame. I mean, we can probably maybe talk a little bit later about this, but Howe's idea of affect is always going to be filtered through cognition, always coming through that sort of consciousness. Without consciousness, we, we don't, uh, you know, experience it. And, and is critical of, of new materialism for the reason that, really, she claims that uh, it ignores consciousness pretty much altogether. So, you know, interesting, but there's a wider reading to be done on that subject. What I want to do, I want to kind of look at this, uh, um, you know, this paradigm shift, this, this emotional turn uh, from a design pers perspective, you know, uh, sort of relating to the, the panel itself. We can do this by looking at um, some of the design uh, theories, popular design theories of Don Norman. Don Norman's interesting because he was the first self-declared user experience design uh, consultant. Uh, he started off very much squarely in kind of cognitive uh, science and cognitive uh, HCI, uh, human-computer interaction. He published this book in 1988, The Design of Everyday Things, and maybe some of you are familiar with this. But what is interesting here is the kind of diagrams that uh, Norman presents in this book and others who have gone on, very much working in that old kind of cognitive brain model. So we have the world itself is discovered purely through perception, the perception of the world, that's the upper di uh, um, uh, diagram there, when it goes through a whole series of things that involve choice and action. We're, we're really kind of in that information processing model of a brain. My favourite one is the one uh, below this, which is that the designer's mental model, which roughly translates to the kind of representation that's kind of stored in memory of some kind, has to match that of a user's mental model. So, you know, in, in a kind of educational way, this is used as a kind of get, get designers to think about what the user uh, is experiencing. With some students, we do uh, some interesting kind of uh, ideas around asking them what's in the box. And we say, imagine that there's an elephant in the box. And then you ask them to maybe draw the elephant or imagine it and in some way to get that kind of way in which uh, uh, representations might be stored in the brain. And of course, they all see similar kind of things. So that, for me, opens a whole can of worms about exactly what is <laughs> either stored or flashing up or tracing in, in the brain in some way. But uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, mental model. So by uh, 2003, we can see how Norman, and he uh, references again Damasio directly, has kind of shifted his, his take into a, this kind of new, new, new um, uh, paradigm, if you like, or emotional turn. And he publishes the book called um, Emotional Design. And we get a new diagram. And this is really interesting because uh, everyone's got to have a diagram, right? So um, This is Don Norman's most famous diagram at the top there. And uh, you know, I'll cut, cut a long story short here. 
um, the visceral always rules, right? The visceral always uh, dictates what happens at the level of behavior and, and cognition, reflection. So that's, that's Norman's uh, point. And it's really, you know, absolutely tied into this emotional brain thesis. How the brain processes emotional experiences is where, where is that, right? So that's Norman. My actual interest is going a little bit kind of uh, into the world of, uh, of HCI and HCI research, human-computer uh, interaction. And I'm interested in the kind of political uh, side of this more so. Um, my idea or take on uh, human-computer interaction research is really it's about getting the brain to work or getting the body to work to start off with, uh, about putting it together, in a, 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 a putting the brain to work in an efficient way. Right, so we can, again, broadly talk about kind of three paradigms here, which map on again to these shifts and turns in brains. So where, where is the brain in the first paradigm? Well, this is, we won't call it the ergonomic paradigm. It's a management of efficient human-machine coupling, so it's body-machine coupling. In fact, the brain doesn't really fit in very much in that. I used uh, some stuff by Gramsci, you know, who looked at the Fordist factory and said that uh, really the brain was quite, you know, left alone. It was about muscular memory. It was about sort of me mechanical habit that was captured by that kind of work. And you can see that, that trace, and there's some direct links between that kind of Taylorist uh, uh, theory of work and early uh, ergonomics. When we get into the, uh, the cognitive paradigm, which maps on exactly to that computer brain uh, metaphor, uh, we start to see things like perception, attention, uh, uh, memory being put to work in, in the models uh, used by uh, HCI, um, you know, uh, HCI researchers. And then, more recently, anyone who kind of works in this area, either, either in, in industry or in academia, you will have noticed that, whereas we used to refer to human-computer interaction, increasingly now we're referring to user experience. Uh, UX, right? It's a big buzzword. It's certainly the industry in London, I'm not too sure about Germany, but it's huge, you know. Um, the, the UX consultant is, a, is a, a, the, the big design, design job in, in the UK. So, um, you know, I link this to uh, the growth of uh, in experienced industries. And, uh, you know, this is not a new concept, of course. There's a couple of old references here. But, uh, you know, these experienced industries are linked to kind of the experience economy, which you might be familiar with. Uh, Alvin Toffler, a long, long time ago, talked about, you know, not about manufactured goods or even ordinary services, but pre-programmed experiences. It's a rather profound uh, thing about the kind of psychops, uh, dominating industries of the future. Similarly, in marketing, you know, there's been a gradual creep. This is from somewhere in the 1980s, one of my students found in a, a literature review, uh, of, of this kind of desire to uh, uh, explore the aesthetics of a consumption experience. So trying to get into that level of experience rather than pure cognition. Following kind of Nigel Frith's work, we can see how this, this kind of uh, feeds into what he calls the cultural circuits of capitalism. So I've adapted that into the cultural circuits of uh, experienced capitalism. And we see how uh, the ideas of neuroscience, particularly this emotional brain thing, starts to feed into a lot of the texts around um, uh, you know, uh, consumer branding, marketing, things like brainfluence, the most awful titles you can really imagine. The buying brain, how to push the button of the buying brain. Of course, a lot of these books are, are complete crap, but... The, the point is, and this is a very thrifty kind of idea, that, that you know, the more this stuff becomes rehearsed, the more it becomes the norm. If you know, in London, I go to quite a few industry uh, sort of based seminars, and this, these diagrams, these books are, are regurgitated over and over again. It becomes sort of part of the rehearsal of these circuits. Okay, you know, and you can see it embedded in, in lots of other different ways as well. Um, you know, this is Norman's diagram. This was a, a piece of software by a Danish company called iMotions. And it was kind of dedicated to user experience design research, but, you know, working specifically on, on emotions. And you just read it, and it's just Damasio repeated over and over again. So, that's kind of, you know, the broad kind of ideas around we've seen uh, in terms of how the brain has been conceived from cognitive model into emotional model. So, what I wanted to do is, uh, in a very kind of Spinoza kind of way, is ask two questions to finish the, off this talk. First one would be, you know, what can a brain, uh, sorry, what can be done to a brain? And then a little bit more optimistic and uh, hopefully uh, relating to some of your work, you know, Hyphen Labs, uh, to ask what, what can a brain do? Um, a little bit more affirmative. So I'm going to quickly run through these because I'm not too sure how much time I've got left. Is it that or that? <laughs> it's that, right, yeah, okay. So I'll run through these. Right, I mean, you know, first one is putting the brain to work in terms of emotional contagion. 
Uh, a lot of you will obviously be familiar with the uh, 2014 uh, uh, Facebook um, you know, uh, effort to try and make uh, emotions go, contagion, uh, go contagious. So that is one way. Um, there are a whole group of uh, uh, you know, startup companies now in the UK, social media marketing companies, looking at the ways in which they can use emotion to fuel virality, you know, programming memes. I love this quote, you know, people share feelings, not information. Uh, low arousal emotions such as contentment and relaxation are useless in the viral economy. Thanks. Uh, of course, you know, Cambridge uh, Analytica scandal, the whole uh, concentration here was a behavioural science, science yeah, data analytics. But, you know, I don't know if anyone watched the Channel 4 sting on, on uh, um, uh, Cambridge Analytica, whole series of videos, really interesting stuff. And, you know, I haven't got time to read all this, but it's, it's really saying that what they want to do is focus on emotions. You know, I don't think the behavioural analytics and the personality trait stuff is, is the, all the story here. Um, you know, it's famous, obviously, for its Trump connection, Brexit, but they're also involved in campaigns in uh, Kenya and Nigeria, which are often less, less coverage about those in, in Western, uh, you know, texts. Uh, interestingly, the, you know, the campaigns they run there, they were running dual uh, uh, social media campaigns, one with positive messages from the official candidate and then a whole stream of really negative, violent videos working at the kind of negative end. So I don't know if you've had time to read that quote, but... Uh, we move on. Another uh, thing is this idea of uh, you know, addiction. Uh, this is a, a book which has kind of got quite a lot of uh, attention the last few years uh, about how you can produce habit-forming uh, technologies. Uh, again, you know, this, this idea of, of focusing on uh, triggering negative emotions is really key in this, this text. So uh, the author argues that you can, complete, uh, can uh, tap into anxieties to create habit-forming uh, use of technology. Okay, so quickly, what can a brain do? <laughs> Let's end on some optimistic stuff. Okay, so you know, a lot of these people who create this stuff, again, this was a, a, you know, a, a big kind of story in technology uh, a few, few a year ago, possibly, about people working in Silicon Valley, disconnecting, blocking, banning, limiting, controlling, preventing. I know I present this to students and they just say, well, there's no way we're going to do that, right? There might be some kind of level of detox, you know, but th th this isn't going to happen. So I think that's probably a, a, a bit of a, 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 an impasse, right? So we've also talked about uh, uh, reverse engineering things like the hook. So, you know, getting people to know their triggers, know that when they're checking endlessly at those notifications, you know, that that is the anxiety feeding kind of a, a, a design, trying to get people, uh, you know, hooked in that particular way. Um, more interestingly, I'm going back to uh, neuroscience and hopefully we can uh, discuss this a little bit more. I mean, the work of Thomas Metzinger is interesting here because Metzinger, you know, specifically talks about using psychoactive drugs and neurotechnologies to rewire the brain, right, rework the brain in a way which we might be talking here. I'm not a big fan of Metzinger. The whole idea of the brain being like a virtual reality Plato's cave seems kind of ridiculous. And, and also, you know, the idea that there's sort of like a second level of representation, like a magical level. I don't agree with that. It, 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 Sh Stephen Shaviro does a really good uh, uh, take on that. But anyway, the point I want to make here, and I, you know, following some positive stuff is, but really th there's a lot of stuff about filters being on or filters being off in the brain. Uh, uh, Metzinger seems to be one of these advocates of kind of, you know, LSD in a, in a way to take the filters off, right? And there was some research recently, I mean, a couple of days ago, where brain scans have kind of, you know, uh, looked at people on LSD, and, and it, it, it seems to cut off information. So, you know, it, it stops the flood of stuff coming in. So, you know, one of the desires of kind of Bergson and a guy called Broad, who uh, was influential at around that time, was how can we take those filters off? You know, um, there's different ways. I mean, <laughs> I'd love to talk about that because I think, in a way, that's what your, your, your work is doing with the, the, the Hyphen Labs. I'm interested in filters being on in this particular uh, sense of experience design because Benjamin Bratton's uh, uh, quote here, right, about speculative design, he talks about the muffling effects of intuitive, neurological and emotional comfort zones. And I do think sometimes, you know, that design uh, to make people feel at ease and comfort is, 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 in a way, putting filters on. Okay, and, and just to conclude, right, okay... Um, you know, going back to the kind of the philosophy and how can we use this stuff to actually do anything uh, of any worth, uh, obviously an endless kind of struggle. I mean, there's an interesting uh, couple of books been released in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, first one is, uh, you know, William Connolly's uh, Aspirational Fascism, 
which directly addresses this kind of current war we have on, on cultural multiplicity. Uh, it's a really interesting book because it talks about the visceral register in which this white working class uh, uh, you know, constituent who votes for Donald Trump, for example, and we've got plenty of those sort of types in the UK as well, and I met some in uh, the bar last night in Germany as well. Yeah, these people operate on the visceral level. I mean, the, the real point that uh, uh, Connolly makes is liberals tend to have this kind of idea of refined thinking will save the day. And uh, he talks about, you know, more closely aligning the refined reasoned thinking of the kind of liberal with those visceral kind of registers in which these people uh, exist, right? Uh, and, you know, this stuff is now on social media. It's spreading, I think, people like Patricia Clough uh, and her kind of uh, take on the kind of more than human uh, you know, user, I mean, not just the user and the user brain and the singular brain, but this kind of collective non-conscious, not, not the collective conscious, not the Dirk Kymian idea, but a collective non-conscious is where we should possibly focus. Cheers. Um, quite a lot to engage with and to consider and get your brains working if they weren't working previously. Um, we've now reached that wonderful interactive stage of the event, which is called the Q&A. So if you guys have some Qs, they will have some As that might in turn generate more Qs. Um, I think we have... Do we have people wandering around, Daphne, or is it uh, the microphones? Okay. Standing mics, as you can see them standing or squatting. Um, so if somebody would like to come up and ask a question, please do so. And in the awkward interim, <laughs> I, I will either ask a question or I'll, what, I'll, what I would like to do is have the panelists perhaps ask questions to each other for a minute. Do you have something you'd like to ask? Yeah. Great. Here's the marked up book copy you were, <laughs> you were mentioning. Um, actually, we picked this up after uh, hearing that we would be on a panel with you because I thought it was interesting thinking about neuroculture, particularly when you talk about like dematerialization and spiritualization. Um, and I'm wondering just, you know, what part of the human collective unconscious is, is trying to vacillate towards dematerialization in, in the world that we live in. And, you know, I think just kind of having conversations with other creators and artists and friends who have never been spiritual or who have never had some sort of fundamental system of belief now vacillating towards that. Is that something that you can... Do I, I don't speak about spiritualism, do I? No. A little bit. Do I? You, you mention <laughs> it. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I'm wondering, if, is it just uh, something you, you were possibly thinking about? I think when we're talking about, uh, about dematerialization, mm -hmm. I think it's more in that kind of Deleuzean kind mm -hmm. of way of uh, getting away from territories and breaking down things. I, it, it very similar to um, uh, one of the ideas in the book, particularly linking to neuroscience, is that uh, people like uh, Robert Zauk, who's a kind of a, an affect psychologist, um, Bruce Wexler, argue that um, the brain desires consonants. You know, you know, it wants to have right. balance. And, and uh, one of the things I argue in there is, particularly in the case of you know, the, kind of the Trump constituent and the Brexit uh, you know, UKIP type of constituent, that what, probably what we need is more cognitive dissonance you know, some sort of shock, some breakdown of those kind of bel belief systems that they have. So uh, it's not really spiritualism, it's more kind of, you know, breaking sort down, breaking that, down yeah. fixed kind of ideas. You know. right. There's a lot of romanticism around that kind of idea about deterritorialization, and I'm quite aware of, you know, the nonsense that that can lead to. Mm -hmm. But I think probably, you know, in, in uh, what I see in your work is an attempt to shake people out of ways of thinking. So, you know, uh, that 
that's that's where I was really at with that. Yeah, m more of a provocation. You know, we we really want to provoke people to think more deeply about not only the world we live in, but also about how we can make conversations around science, art, and technology more accessible. Um, more than anything about saying something specific about the brain or how different regions of the brain are working or saying that we're trying to target different regions of the brain because that you know if that's what you mean by territorializing yes. um, different yes, brain yes. regions you know we want to say take a, a concept or an idea in neuroscience and translate it into a story so that it, it sticks more in your mind more like your node-based learning you know where if we say the neuron or a synapse and we tell you a story about it, then the next time you hear that word, you'll have that vision in your mind about what it is and how it functions. Yeah. Yeah. Also, and also giving the agency, so having and embodying that character. We were working, um, we were, when we were designing the piece itself, we were wondering how we, if we should make this like a passive experience but not knowing what the effects of virtual reality are, we wanted to experiment with the feeling of embodiment and um, ownership over the experience. And then also that kind of, like, as you were talking about, the psychedelic experience of losing your body and how that also grounds the, the, the message or it gives more meaning to the message. Um, because at that point, everyone, regardless of who is in the headset, is having the same experience, whether or not they identify with the individual that they're embodying or not. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. Have you read Max Singer at all? No. Oh, right, okay. You, sh you should look into that because that's talking about using neurotechnologies mm -hmm. to kind of shock people out of the you know, fixed ways of, of, mm -hmm. of thinking and turning the filters off. Another thing I was interested in, in case we've not got any questions, is... Um, when yeah, I read don't everybody oh. rush up at once. Um. <laughs> When I read your interviews, uh, I, I, I did a piece in another book about empathy, and particularly you know, Obama's kind of mobilization of empathy. Um, you, I can't remember which one of you it was, but made a really interesting comment about not liking empathy. And you know, I, yeah. for me, it's kind of something that could be weaponized quite easily. Uh, you know, there's a tendency to say, oh, wow, you know, that's what we need to do is be in each other's shoes. But you made a fantastic point. I don't know if you recall it. But, uh. Yeah, I mean, we talk, I mean, in, in virtual reality, uh, the more you hear people speak about their work and see VR as this empathy machine, we want to break with that sort of theory and thought because if you're making a piece that is showing a hardship or something that a culture has had to go through, one specifically that isn't your own, who are you to put yourself in the position of being empathetic mm -hmm. towards that situation without understanding what it's actually like to be there. So you have a headset on and you're theoretically present in that experience because the creator has made it so and you know you can't really look anywhere else because you have a headset on. But you know we like to think of it more as being mindful uh, of the story that we're telling you and to let go of whatever preconceived notions that you may have and just look at the story and experience it as we intend for you to experience and then come away with hopefully a, a new understanding and a new way to engage with groups that you see in, in the experience. Um, we do have some people lining up. Um, yes, please. Hello. Um, so I have a question. I guess it's primarily for Tony, but it might be relevant to the hyphen labs as well. Um, but I, since you're, um, and this is kind of associative, but since you're theorizing um, experience cap experiential capitalism, I was wondering if you've thought about dreams and the ways in which um, dreams are kind of summoned to sell products to people. I'm just like very tuned into how the language of dreams appears in marketing and, you know, and in, in the you know, little bits of commercial language that floats around. Um, because it, it seems like on one hand, dream might be this space outside of capitalism, but with the comp computational model of the brain, there's this 
almost lust to map dreams and dream space and to um, figure out, you know, how images are stored in the brain. So does a post-computational um, notion of the brain just totally destroy that project? And then my next question, which is kind of related, is uh, about the ambivalent relationship of affect theory to psychoanalysis. And I thought you did a great overview of kind of debates in affect theory. Um, and then there's, you know, frequently language that you would connect with psychoanalysis use, like this idea of the unconscious or the unthought or something that's latent but um, still drives behavior. So I'm wondering if in some ways affect theory is returning to some psychoanalytic um, ideas or if it's just completely rejecting it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, no, I hadn't really thought about dreams, but that's, that's fascinating. One, one thing I've got that's kind of related to that is I work with uh, uh, the, the, the social theorist Gabriel Tard's work, and Tard identified the social kind of being as a sleepwalker, yeah. a somnambulist. So uh, I'm really interested in that. But what I'm more interested in is sleep, maybe even dreams. Uh, there's some really interesting stuff by Matt Fuller on that. Uh, you know, if you're looking for a non-phenomenological -phenom world, right, sleep is where to go because it's where the self switches off. You know, we, he talks about we might get some clues maybe through dreams, but in dream is just light sleep, isn't it? Once you're asleep, you're asleep. So I'm uh, interested in that sense about what, what the non-conscious can be understood, how it can be understood through the idea of sleepwalking, which is, you know, out, non-self, right, but walking and, 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 and existing. So I was interested in looking at maybe things like social media use in that context. Yeah, and interestingly, early technologies of movement, uh, particularly early cinema, mm. featured somnambulists quite yeah. often yeah, yeah. And, and led to you know, plays with doppelgangers and other sorts of things so yeah. that you, the technologies allowed you to understand yourself in a, in a fundamentally different way. Jonathan Crary's work. Jonathan Crary's yeah. work, yeah. Yeah, so I was also going to comment on that where we do find ourselves in, in the sleep mode, though, with the constant um, influence of technology where we're not ever really turning off at this moment. Yeah. And while you're saying we can't necessarily like disengage with our smartphones and our computers, how can we then like turn off without, and how can we turn off and not be in this sleep mode where we're always able to interact with each other and communicate and how is that rewiring our our conscious and then our our subconscious yeah. as well yeah I, 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 can i come back to the freud thing as well though the, 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 the psychoanalysis uh, there's a there's a I, I can't remember the exact quote but deleuze says that freud mistook the unconscious for daddy's voice it, it really is the crowd something like that and that, that that that's where my kind of approach comes into it uh, I, I i don't think there's a, <laughs> you know a, a, a psychoanalytic unconscious. I, I, I think it's more of a way that we relate to each other and relate to our experiences. Um, so <laughs> I don't know if that helps, but uh, well, also the language of dreams is not always glorious and wonderful no, and yeah, euphoric. Yeah, yeah. It's often yeah. harrowing. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. Next question, please. Thank you for those presentations. Um, I'm thinking about the way over the past several decades there have been numerous theories that. Um, offer interpretations of the human subject that fragment the subject away from a kind of coherent subject position. So you've got like Deleuze and the individual, and then cybernetics proposes a kind of uh, permeable boundary between subject and object and so on and so forth. And Tony, I was thinking about your condensed but really good overview of academic and industry situated literatures on users and user experience design and the way that user experience design almost needs to rehabilitate a static human subject that is homogenous, complete, and also predictable. So in order to design um, virtual reality systems, for instance, like those of Hyphen Labs, or um, technologies that require human interaction to be activated, there needs to be an element of certainty about the subject that that technology is being designed for and around. So user experience design almost needs to hypothesize or postulate a particular fixed image 
of the user before it can begin to craft the technologies that are responsive to or reactive to user intervention. So I'm just wondering, Tony, in your literary overview and in your, your critical practice as an academic, what critiques you would have to advance of the user in user experience design and also maybe um, hyphen labs. You talked a bit about the importance of including diverse representations within virtual reality as a kind of playable space, but how do you approach the process of designing an experience from the perspective of the user in user experience design and how do you make that user open up to diverse possibilities beyond those that are already within the kind of industry literature around user experience? Thank you. Sure, I can kind of jump into the last part of your question uh, with the, including the user in the experience of design. So before we made our virtual reality piece of it, we had several workshops. Um, we were part of a residency at New Inc. in New York. It's a tech incubator and accelerator affiliated with the New Museum. And we brought people in from our community who are black women who are within the community that we were trying to speak to and design with. So it has to be a collaboration and a conversation rather than making something and then expecting that it will be helpful or useful to someone. And I think so often, you know, in our work, we want to bridge this, this gap between academia and community and praxis and you know, execution. And in order to do that, there has to be a level of trust and there has to be a constant evaluation and reevaluation and iteration. And we, you know, we often don't get it right, but it's the intentionality of, of trying to do that that I think that we're trying to get better at. And I'd also add that we find so many, let's say, products that are marketed or that are offered to us have a kind of one size fits all user um, definition. And what we're trying to do is get away from that a bit and make a hyper-specific experience for a specific user that potentially all types of people can enjoy, can learn from, can integrate some of the things that we're saying in, into their own experience, but not saying that something that is made for me will be great for you and great for everybody else in this room because we all come from different places um, so looking back into our own histories and our own cultures, our families and our, our own um, personal experiences, then not to make hyper-personal work, but to make more, more interesting collective work. Um, yeah, okay, so there's this sort of tension, isn't there, between the kind of consumer surveillance model you know, the, the, the surveillance of intimate detail about particular users. But um, also, I think, on the other hand, there's this kind of, um, I mean, to repeat some, some of the kind of user experience curriculum, you know, it's, it's not about the user, it's about the user experience. And you design for the experience, not the user. I've heard that said, you know, a few times. In a way, that's, to me, you know, I, I don't want to over-theorise this, but I probably will. Um, it's kind of almost Whiteheadian. You know, we've got the kind of the whole idea of, the, you know, the, that the experience belonging to the individual is no, no, you know, it's, it's experience is out there. You know, experience doesn't need to have a subject in, in the sense of a user subject. So I, I think that kind of churning and production of experiences, you know, the producing of experience is, is, is in contrast to those kind of, you know, surveillance models of, of, of the user. So I'm not, I'm starting to do some stuff with this sleepwalking thing around that, you know, but um, I couldn't really say much more than that. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question, so excellent. And this side of the hall has been carrying your weight, you know, for the <laughs> Q&A. Just want you to know. Some ambulists. <laughs> uh, thanks very much for the talk. Um, I have noticed that in the fields of neuroengineering and BCI, there's a relative lack of critical and cultural awareness. And I was wondering if you could speak to sort of strategies for consciousness raising, uh, and bringing that sort of critical theory into the neuroscience lab, uh, because I think if we don't do that, there will be disastrous consequences. Well, yeah, okay, I mean, there's a, you know, the, the, the trend in the university at the moment is interdisciplinarity, 
and uh, kind of mixed methods and uh, you know trying to get critical theorists in the same room as say HCI engineers uh, and, and talking about those things. You know, if you talk to a lot of people involved in that, it's tough because you know, it's uh, almost like a, a different brain, you know, the engineer's brain and the uh, critical theorist brain. But you know, that, that's all, all you can do, and you can get in there and, and do it. I mean, you know, hopefully, it, it, that free paradigms thing that I was talking about, and that's an HCI text. So you know, it's been picked up by a couple of HCI people. You know, just reference it as some piece of junk, whatever. But so it's gradually getting in in that way. So uh, you know, interdisciplinarity seems one way of of, of entering into those relationships with other disciplines where you might overcome some of the things you're talking about. But, uh, yeah. I'd also add that a lot of the, I mean, at least the, a lot of the places that we were visiting that were um, in Silicon Valley were actually located within East Palo Alto, that has do, and, but it doesn't serve the communities in which they exist. And so it, it's so funny where it's like, where, where these large corporations are saying, you know, we want to raise culture and consciousness, yet they can't walk outside their front door. <laughs> or and invite people in, exactly. So how, and I think what we're really trying to do is figure out how can we collaborate with the community so that the community can also have a say in the direction that, you know, neuroculture goes in. And that's why, that's, that's why we all wanted to start this project was because we saw there were too many speculations of these like doomsday or these like um, you know rewriting um, memories or um, and so we wanted to work on something that was completely different that had that was related to culture. Um, so we started using social media to find you know people who were influencing culture and um, that were influencing us and and reaching out to. You know, and talking to everybody, not feeling as if there were individuals that weren't worth, you know, our time because they didn't necessarily have the capacity to understand what we were talking about because we have a really weird title to our project. Um, but I just wanted to add to that. It's also creating a platform. You know, there sometimes there companies or um, institutions don't have the infrastructure or the network to bring people in and, and speak to them and include them in the way that is necessary in order to set them up for success. But there are organizations that do that. Like in the US, there's like Black Girls Code or Women Who Code, you know, that is what they do. And they are that bridge, they're the glue um, that can make this work, but also, we often think a lot about like once people get into these institutions, if there isn't an infrastructure for support there, then you know they leave. We left because there wasn't that support, so we had to leave, build it for ourselves. And now, now that we have the platform for people to speak about their experiences and to also show what they, what we are capable of, now it's time to go back and say, hey, this is the way that things could be different. Um, and I think it's, it's, it takes a lot of work, but if there's a kind of mass movement towards doing that, we'll see a shift. There's no choice but there, for there to be a shift. Great, so it's not so much necessary, I mean, the panel showed what can be done to a brain, what can we, you know, what can a brain do? But more importantly, what can be done with a brain and how that makes us feel? And even though much of this is very futurist and speculative, I think we should thank them in the traditional manner.